So in this first hand, the hijack opens for $40. I looked down at two queens and decided to put in a three bet. I make it 130 to go. It folds over to the small blind who is a regular here uh, in Vegas. I played with him a few times. He's, he's, a good, he's definitely a good player. I think he trends a little bit tighter uh, than some other regs, but definitely capable of, uh, of widening his range here and there. So he's in the small blind and he makes it 360 to go. And it folds back to me. I think when it goes hijack open, cut off three bet, uh, I think our ranges can be a little bit on the wider side here, uh, as opposed to if the original raise was from under the gun and say the three bet was from under the gun plus one or plus two, for example, something like that. So I think he could be taking advantage of, um, of my three bet. I don't know the original razor, so I don't think he's a reg. Um, so he could be coming after me thinking I'm raising this guy a little bit lighter. So um, I don't see myself folding this hand, um, certainly not pre-flop and on a good flop, probably not on a good flop either. So, um, so I decided to call and we go heads up. Flop is pretty good for my hand. Flop is 10-10-7 with two hearts. He puts in a C bet like I expect him to do with his entire range. He bets 330. At this point I'm planning on just going with the hand, planning on calling him down. I expect him to jam a brick turn uh, even if he has ace-king, ace-queen, ace-jacked, one of those types of hands. Um, obviously if he has aces or kings, he's going to be moving in with that. Um, and I'm probably just going to have to pay him off in that case. Again, I always come back to the fact that it's hard to define someone else's range. And it's better to kind of just play your own range, I think. Um, pocket queens, definitely towards the top of my range here. So planning on just going with the hand regardless. So I flat the, uh, the C-bet and we go to a turn. Turn is not a good card at all. Turn is an ace. Now I am behind the vast majority of his range, I think. He, d he continues betting, uh, but he puts out a very small bet. He bets 250. Tiny bet into this pot, um, but he's only got about three, 350 behind after this bet. It's a pretty crappy situation. We're losing to a ton of his bluffs, a ton of his pre-flop bluffs. Um, if he has any sort of suited ace type hands, we're obviously losing now. We still lose to those big over pairs. We don't beat very much. We can beat jacks. If he does have some suited connectors in his range, like 6-5, things like that, um, he could probably also have a bunch of 10s in his range. So there's not a whole lot that we beat here. If we call here, we're obviously never folding. And just gonna have to go with it in the end I thought for a while but in the end I just I just assumed that there's such a narrow part of his range that we can still beat in this spot my hand goes from the top of my range to a complete standard bluff catcher not a good situation I don't think so I decided to let it go it's it's pretty uh, it feels pretty gross to have to fold to a $250 bet into this this size of a pot but it's possible there's there's some percentage of the time where I'm going to get bluffed there by some suited connector type hand or if he happens to have a king queen or a king jack type hand in his three bet range then we're going to have to get bluffed here sometimes but I don't know I let it go um, not too sure if that's a good fold or not but oh well pretty bad turn card good turn card for him regardless. I don't know, maybe it saved me the last uh, five or six hundred dollars or so. I did fire the hand over to the uh, text message group to get some feedback and two uh, very smart poker players that I'm friends with disagreed with each other. One of them agreed with me, they took the exact same line that I did. The other one said that he would just call down, call turn, call river, so still grinding, gonna get back to it, stuck a little bit, but game seems decent so I'm gonna keep after it most interesting hand of the evening the hijack who is a regular he opens for $40 look down at pocket eights on the button pretty standard call I think 
Uh, don't want to don't want a three bet and don't want to face a four bet. So standard call, I think, and the big blind calls as well. So we go three ways to a flop of nine seven six with two hearts. So we flop second pair and open ender. They both check to me, and I decide to put in a bet. Uh, we can often have the best hand here. We block all straights and we protect ourselves a little bit from any over cards coming and ending up with the worst hand. So I think a bet is okay because we can even call a raise. We can call a check raise. So I put in a bet and I bet $80. The big line does decide to put in a raise. He check raises to 200. Not a very big raise. Uh, it's only 120 more. So it's back on us and obviously can't fold here with an open-ended straight draw uh, for this price. So I think it's a pretty standard call. Call seems pretty straightforward. Turn is a brick. Turn is an offsuit four, which changes nothing. So this time he bets $500. And this is a pretty big turning point for the hand. It's a pretty big bet size here on the turn. Uh, very big, close to pot size. So the question is, do you want to call and draw to your straight as well as to some potential bluff cards, which would include all hearts. The straightforward play, I think, is to just let it go with that bet sizing. It's pretty big bet sizing. It's a question of whether, you, whether you'll get paid off when your straight comes in, and will you have fold equity when a heart comes in. So he has about $1,200, maybe a little more, maybe $1,250 behind the $500. So there's decent uh, stack size left to be played if I call the 500. It seems like we have a good number of cards that we can hit that to either improve our hand or to rep as a bluff. It seems like we'll more likely have a flush draw here than a straight draw because um, perhaps some players might be reluctant to draw to a straight with a flush draw on board. So I think we could pretty credibly rep a, uh, a heart, uh, a heart flush if a heart comes in on the river. So I decided to make the call and we head to the river. River brings the heart flush in. River is the king of hearts. My opponent, he does the uh, the little act where he grabs some chips and then he checks. It's kind of a sign where uh, people, you know, they put on the show like they're, uh, they're ready for action. They're ready to uh, call any bet. And usually uh, it's just that, it's a show. So. Uh, that's a little bit uh, extra confidence boost for the uh, the bluff Represent the flush uh, So I decided to stick to the plan Grab some uh, some of those ten dollar orange chips and grab all my black chips that I have and assemble a bet of About twelve hundred and fifty dollars send that out into the middle The big line he asks how much it is and it uh, it covers him so he goes into the tank and uh, cue the elevated heart rate, which I still get. Um, sem semi surprisingly, after uh, all these years, still get the elevated heart rate in uh, big pot situations. But good news is that uh, I get it whether we are value betting or bluffing. So pretty tough for uh, anyone to get a read off of that, I think. I mean, I don't know. I've never really uh, stared at myself. Anyway, he's in the. He goes into the tank and uh, talks to himself. Talks to me a little bit. I don't really engage in these situations, so uh, I'm just kind of uh, passing the time. Then uh, he says uh, the the magic words or the uh, the non-magic words. I'm not sure what you want to call it, but he says, "Eh, flush is good." Tosses in a few chips, and uh, that's some bad news. I say, "You got it." Uh, I show the pocket eights, and. Uh, he rolls over 9-7 of diamonds, so he flopped top two pair there. So even if uh, I don't really hate my line, I think my line for sure makes sense from a theoretical perspective. Uh, and even if you showed me his 9-7 on the river, I'm pretty sure I would still make the, uh, the all-in bluff there because when he has 9-7 there, it makes it less likely that I have uh, 9-8 or 7-8. Eight. 
and he so he blocks the straight draw and he doesn't block the flush draw so it makes it more likely that I have the flush draw so in that regard I still like my play from a theoretical perspective so the question is and this uh, is the conversation that I had with the old text message group once again one of my friends agreeing with my line and one of my friends saying just give it up give it up on the uh, on the turn because people don't like folding question is what's best do you do you play from that uh, theoretical perspective and take the GTO line make the all-in bet because it's pretty likely you don't have the best hand here and and his holdings uh, should make it more of a fold or do you go the uh, the exploitive route and assume that live players um, they they don't like to fold people don't like to fold you know people uh, live poker is very slow it takes you a long time to make a hand like two pair or a set or something like that and it is no fun folding these hands so that being the natural human trait people get bored they like making hands they don't like folding what's best should you take that theoretical line that that gto line or should you take the exploitive line and uh just fold or just check it back and give up it's the never-ending debate you have to try and uh pigeonhole people as best you can see who's in a folding mood see who isn't uh see who came to vegas to play some hands and not fold and see who has more patience to wait for a better spot. It's tough to, uh, to pinpoint who is, who, which player is, you know, in which, in which bracket. So I really like my line, uh, from a theoretical perspective. Do I like it from the average, uh, the average live lineup? I'm happy that I was able to, uh, make sense of the situation and pull the trigger on the river i'm happy about that not happy about losing the pot because that's a bunch of money but oh well you move on try to make it back mm -hmm.